Hi, welcome to our next segment. We've been looking at other 20th century art movements. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Mexican muralists. Um, in particular, the artist Diego Rivera, who was married to Frida Kahlo. You learned about her work and her self-portraits um, in our segment uh, related to surrealism. So, a major revival of Mexican art took place in the 1920s and 1930s by artists um, who had a training um, in the age-old tradition of fresco painting. Using murals that all could see and appreciate, um, the Mexican muralists usually promoted a political or social message. These didactic paintings have an unmistaken, unmistaken meaning rendered in an easy-to-read format. These themes generally promote the labor and struggle of the working class and usually had a socialist agenda. Um, here is a, a later um, mural done by a Mexican artist. Um, I'm showing this just to give you um, a sense of how um, the Mexican muralists um, have influenced um, later work. Um, so at the, the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Mexico City, visitors entered the rectory, um, the main administration building. Beneath an, imp beneath an imposing three-dimensional arm emerges from a mural. Several hands, one with a pencil, um, charged toward a book with lists, which lists critical dates in Mexico's history. Um, 1520, the conquest by Spain. 1810, the independence from Spain. 1857, the liberal constitution, which established individual rights. And 1910, the start of the revolution against the regime um, of Porifo Diaz. Um, David Alfaro Sequerios um, left the final date blank in the dates in, in dates, Mexican history on the right um, for culture. Um, this, that's the title of the work. <laughs> Um, inspiring viewers to create Mexico's next great historic moment. So this is a good example of how this this art is very political and really does have a, you know, relates to issues of social um, class and um, socioeconomic status and, and labor rights and, and things like that. Um, the revolution. From 1910 to 1920, civil war raged um, um, in, the, um, in, the, in Mexico. Um, and ravaged the nation as citizens revolted against um, the dictator Porfirio Diaz. At the heart of the revolution was the belief itself revolutionary that the land should be in the hands of laborers, um, the very people who worked it. Um, this demand um, for reform um, singled a new age in Mexican society. Issues concerning the popular masses, um, universal public education and health care, expanded civil liberties were at the forefront of government policy. As you can see, um, a lot of art um, history movements that we've looked at, um, especially new ones that have sort of sprouted up, are usually in reaction to some sort of political um, disturbance, um, some sort of um, war, uh, you know, civil war, or, you know, just some sort of um, political injustice. You know, we saw that with Romanticism, um, we saw it with German Expressionism, and um, we'll continue to see that being a motivator factor in a lot of these um, new um, isms in, in the 20, 20th and 20th um, first century um, sprout. So um, again, this idea of Mexican muralism um, happened at the end of the revolution. Um, the government um, commissioned artists to create art that could educate the mostly illiterate masses about Mexican history. Um, this is a technique we saw that the early Christian um, Christians did. You know, a lot of the beautiful Byzantine um, mosaics and a lot of the frescoes um, and um, early depictions of early Christian art, you know, because their worshipers and congregation weren't literate, were meant to sort of inform them and educate them on the stories um, related to Christianity. Celebrating the, Mexican pe celebrating the Mexican people's potential to craft the nation's history was a key theme in Mexican muralism, a movement led by Sequerios, Diego Rivera, and Jose Clemente Oro Zoco, and they became known as the Los Tres Grandes. Um, between the 1920s and 1950s, they cultivated a style that defined Mexican identity following the revolution. The muralist developed an iconography featuring atypical non-European heroes from the nation's illustrious past, present, and future, Aztec warriors battling the Spanish, 
humble peasants fighting in the revolution, common laborers of Mexico City, and the mixed race um, people who will forge the next great epic. Like in Sequerio's um, UNAM mural that we just looked at, Los Tres Grandes crafted epic murals on the walls of highly visible public buildings using techniques like fresco, encaustic painting, mosaic, and sculptural painting. One of the earliest government commissions for a post-revolutionary mural was for the National Preparatory School, a high school in Mexico City, affiliated with UNAM. During the 1920s, Los Tres Grandes and other artists com completed works um, throughout the school's um, expansive interiors and interiors. Um, Orozoco painted nearly two dozen murals at the school, including destruction of the Old Order 1926, which you see um, depicted here. It depicts two figures in peasant attire who watch 19th century neoclass who watch a 19th century neoclassical structures fracture into cubist-like piles, signaling the demise of the past. Just as Sequeros, um, Sequeros's UNAM murals. Um, anticipate an unrealized historic event, the new order. Implied in Orozoko's work is the world these men will encounter once they turn to face the viewer. These anonymous men are unlikely heroes given their modest attire, yet they represent a new age where the revolution has liberated the masses from centuries of repression. Um, this is a recreated version of a painting done by Diego Rivera. Um, who was widely regarded as the most influential Mexican artist of the 20th century. Diego Rivera was truly a larger-than-life figure who spent significant periods of his career in Europe and the U.S., in addition to his native Mexico. Together with David Alfaro Sequeras and Jose Clemente Orozoco, Rivera was among the leading members and founders of the Mexican muralist movement, deploying a style informed by disparate, disparate sources such as European modern masters, and Mexico's pre-Columbian heritage, and executed in the technique of Italian fresco painting, Riviera handled major themes appropriate to the scale of his chosen art form, social inequality, the relationship of nature, industry and technology, and the history and fate of Mexico. More than half a century after his death, Riviera is still among the most re um, revered figures in Mexico, celebrated for both his role in the country's artistic renaissance and reinvigoration of the mural genre as well as for his out, outsized or big person, um, persona. So this is an image called Man at the Crossro Crossroads. Um, it was a fresco done by Diego Rivera um, in New York City's Rockefeller Center. The painting was controversial because it included an image of linen and um, a Soviet Russian May Day Parade. Despite protests from artists, um, Nelson Rockefeller ordered its destruction before it was completed. Only black and white photographs exist of the original incomplete mural taken when Riviera was forced to stop working on it. Using the photographs, Riviera repainted um, the composition in Mexico under the variant title, Man Controller of Universe. Um, Riviera made um, the painting of murals his primary method, method appreciating the large scale and public ac accessibility, the opposite of what we re regarded as the elitist character of paintings in galleries and museums. If you think about it, a, a public work, a, a work of art that has that scale um, and is, you know, displayed publicly can be, you know, viewed by all. Um, when we think of museums and galleries, there is a sort of you know, you have to enter a building, there's this sort of um, elitism and obviously, you know, a, a certain sort of class, um, you know, during this time, um, you know, would have, would only have, you know, would, would have the leisure time to go and visit um, museums and art galleries. You know, here you have um, people going to work and, um, you know, carrying on their daily lives and so being able to view public works of art would be more accessible to the working class. Um, Riviera used the walls of universities and other public buildings throughout Mexico and the United States on his canvas, creating an extraordinary body of work that re revived interest in the, in the mural as an art form and helped um, reinvent the concept of public art in the U.S. by paving the way for the federal art program of the 1930s. 
Um, Mexican cultural and history um, constituted the major themes and influence of R Riviera's art. Um, Riviera, who amassed an enormous collection of pre-Columbian artifacts, created panor panoramic portrayals of Mexican history in daily life, from its Mayan beginnings up to the Mexican Revolution and post-revolutionary present, in a style largely indebted to pre-Columbian culture. We just learned about that when we looked at indigenous um, art from the Americas. A lifelong Marxist who belonged to the Mexican Communist Party um, and had important ties to the Soviet Union, Riviera is an exemplar of the socially committed um, artist. His art expressed his outspoken commitment to left-wing political causes, depicting such subjects as Mexican peasantry, American workers, and revolutionary figures like... Um, in, uh, Emiliano Zapata um, and Lenin. At times, his outspoken, uncompromising leftist politics um, collided with the wishes of wealthy patrons, as we saw with um, his image um, that was taken down or destroyed at the Rockefeller Center, and aroused significant um, controversy that um, emanated inside and outside the art world. His first commission from the Mexican Minister of Education, Jose Vasconcelos, um, creation is the first of Riviere's many murals and touchstones for Mexican muralism, treat, um, treating in the artist's words the origins of the sciences and the arts, a kind of condensed version of human history. The work is a complex allegorical composition combining Mexican, Judeo-Christian, and Hellenistic motifs. It depicts a number of allegorical figures, among them faith, hope, charity, education, and science, all seemingly represented with unmistakable, unmistakable Mexican features. Um, the figure of Song was modeled on Guadalupe Marion, who later became Riviera's second wife. Remember, he was married to Frida Kahlo, um, his first wife. Um, through such features, uh, of the work and the use of gold leaf and the monumental elongated figures, the mural reflects the importance of Italian and Byzantine art for Riviera's development. So we're going to be focusing on this mural on, um, done by Riviera. Um, it's called In Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Alameda Central Park. Um, and here we see hundreds of characters from 400 years of Mexican history gathering for a stroll through Mexico's um, city's largest park. Um, but the colorful balloons, impeccably dressed visitors and vendors with diverse wares cannot conceal the dark side of this dream. A confrontation between an indigenous family and a police officer, if you look closely, um, a man shooting into the face of someone being trampled by a horse in the midst of a skirmish. Um, we see a sinister skeleton smiling at the viewer. So what kind of dream or nightmare is this? And what do you think Diego Riviera's intention was in creating this work? We will find out. So I know that image before is hard to see, so I'm going to show you some details. So here's the, the detail that I was referring to with the rearing horse and, and a man um, shooting another man in the face. Um, and, and so one of the movements that we should think about is surrealism. Um, in the spirit of surrealism, this is, um, this is probably a complex dream. For surrealists like Salvador Dali, dreams were the principal subject matter. Since dreams are so personal and strange, this allowed artists to juxtapose unrelated matter like clocks and ants, in, in the case of Dali, um, in, in his um, famous depiction, The Persistence of Memory. I showed you that um, earlier in our Surrealism segment. The Riviere never officially joined the Surrealist. He used this approach in Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Almeida Central Park as he cobbled together a scene composed of disparate historical um, personages, including Hernan um, Cortes, the Spanish conqueror who initiated the fall of the Aztec Empire, um, Sor Juana, a 17th century nun and one of Mexico's most notable writers. We actually looked at, um, when we were looking at uh, colonial art from, the, from New Spain, um, we, we looked at a portrait of her. Um, 
Porfirina Diaz, whose dictatorship at the turn of the 20th century inspired the Mexican Revolution. Perhaps the most striking group is a central um, quartet of, of figures featuring um, Diego Rivera, um, the artist Frida Kahlo. I think you can see her. She's pretty recognizable. Um, and the printmaker and draftsman Jose Guadalupe Posada and La Catrina. Catrina was a nickname in the early 20th century for an elegant upper class woman who dressed in European clothing. And you can see here, um, she's also a skeleton. This character became infamous in Posada la Calavera de la Catrina, Catrina the Catrina skeleton, um, done in 1913. It's an etching. Um, here, the renowned um, printmaker depicted La Catrina as a skeleton in order to critique the Mexican elite. In Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Alameda, Central Park, Riviera reproduces the original Posada print and adds an elaborate boa reminiscent of the feathered Mesoamerican serpent god um, Quetzalcoatl. And we looked at, we, that was one of the, um, we studied um, that god in one of um, the works we looked at with indigenous Americas um, around her neck. Let me get back to it. So you can actually see here, remember the serpent motif was was a really um, important image, both in um, um, Native American art as well as um, um, Andean or Mesoamerican art as well. So you can see here the feather snake boa. La Catrina unites two great Mexican artists in this mural. She holds, she holds Rivera's hand as her other arm is held by Posada. Though Posada died in obscurity in 1913, artists later brought attention to, artists later brought attention to his work and he was a significant influence on the Mexican muralist. The fourth character in this um, quartet is Kahlo, Frida Kahlo. She stands behind a child version of her husband. <laughs> this is him right here. I think it looks kind of funny and again very telling of probably what their relationship was like when they were married um, with one hand protectively on his shoulder and her other hand holds um, a yin-yang object in Chinese philosophy yin and yang refer to opposites yet interdependent interdependent forces like day and night Within the name of this concept is um, perhaps the most fundamental duality in human humanity, female yin and male yang. Thus, this Chinese symbol becomes a metaphor for Riviera and Kahlo's complex relationship. Riviera began as um, Kahlo's mentor, then they married, separated, got back together, they were political comrades, and they painted each other frequently. Their double portraits, um, which we looked at one um, earlier when we looked at the work of Frida Kahlo often reflect the state of the couple's relationship at that moment. Um, and Frida and Diego Rivera, um, we, we saw that earlier, she subtly plays with the couple's stature in order to emphasize Riviera's influence on her. Kahlo was, was ill as Riviera worked on this mural and his, and his um, diminished size may reflect his feelings of helplessness when she was sick during this time. You have to remember that Frida Kahlo also um, had, you know, was quite ill and, and had been in a, a car accident, a bus accident, and also had a heart condition. Um, she had had a bout with polio when she was young that, um, off, that made her lame as well in terms of walking. So she, she had a lot of medical issues. Stepping away from the center, if one reads the mural-like text, a chronologically, a chronological, a chronology emerges. The left side of the composition highlights the conquest and colonization of Mexico, the flight for independence, and the revolution um, occupy the majority of central space and modern achievements fill the right. For some art historians, the central area, area is a snapshot of bourgeois um, life in 1895 as refined ladies and gentlemen promenade in their Sunday best under the watchful eye of poor Poor Refirio Diaz, I cannot pronounce his first name. It's spelled P-O-R-F-I-R-I-O. In um, his plumbed military garb, one gets a sense of the inequality 
um, that stirred average, average Mexicans to overthrow their dictator and initiate the Mexican Revolution, which lasted from 1910 until 1920. In this light, we can appreciate the dreams and nightmares within each epoch. Um, to the left of the balloons, the nightmare of the conquest and religious intolerance during the colonial era give way to a dream of democratic nation a democratic nation during the 19th century, represented by the oversized figure of Benito Juarez, which you see back here. Here, he's sort of at the crescendo, kind of at this pyramid of people that we see in the composition. He restored the republic after French occupation and attempted to modernize the country as president. On the right of the composition, beyond, beyond the bandstand, the battles of the revolution give way to a society where land and liberty, as championed by the workers' flag, become a tangible reality. So, more often than not, history is often written by the victor and thus reflects an incomplete story. Um, Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in Almada Central Park is an antidote to this. Riviera guarantees that the histories normally edited out, the stories of the indigenous and the masses, have, have a place in this grand narrative. The artist reminds the viewer that the struggle and glory of four centuries of Mexican history are due to the participant, participation of Mexicans from all strata of society. All right, I'm going to stop here. Um, in our next segment, we're going to be looking at abstract expressionism, so stay tuned.